speaker. Yeah, thank you, Noah. I uh, appreciate that. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're grateful for you taking time out. And uh, we know that there's going to be a large number of people watching this online later, too. So we appreciate you taking the time to watch this. Uh, we're really excited about tonight. Uh, Dr. James White is a professor of, of plant pathology and mycology at Rutgers University. And uh, he's, he's kind of taking the soil health world by storm a little bit, I think, because I know that uh, up until a year or two ago, I'd never heard of this guy. And now I see him all over the place because he's got this great talk uh, about uh, this rhizophagy subject, which he's going to be talking about. When I first heard him do this, it was on John Kemp's podcast, which we had John on last week. And uh, by the way, uh, Dr. White, John says hi and speaks very highly of your work. Uh, but but uh, when I heard you speak on John Kemp's uh, podcast, I said, man, we've got to get this guy uh, on board <clears throat> with some of the things that we're doing. So uh, I reached out to you, uh, I don't know when that was, six months ago or something, asked you to write an article for our Soil Health Resource Guide, and you were gracious enough to provide that. So a little sneak preview uh, for those of you, we will be coming out with a new version of that resource guide in January, and Dr. White will have an article in there. Uh, on the same topic of rhizophagy and, and essentially how plants essentially are farming their own microbes. So it's a fascinating topic. Um, I will be the first to admit I do not understand it very well. So I'm looking forward to learning right along with everybody else. So uh, Dr. White, uh, go ahead and take it away. And um, like Noah said, we will uh, hopefully save 10, 15 minutes at the end here for question and answer. Okay, thank you, Keith. Do you, do you still see my screen or do I need to share again? Uh, I think you need to share again. I cannot see it right okay. now. Okay, all right, that's fine. So. Yeah, okay. there you go. I can now see you, it now. Now you got it. Okay, yep. okay, okay, that's good. So I've got yep. to go I'm back going to the disappear. Spot. Okay, so uh, uh, Keith, you, you essentially said what I was going to do. Uh, you didn't steal all my thunder, but you, you introduced me very well. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, what I'm going to try to convince you uh, of is that plants are cultivating or are farming microbes in their roots. And they are uh, they're essentially tracking microbes to the roots. They're internalizing those microbes into the root cells. They're extracting nutrients from the microbes. And uh, then they are are putting surviving microbes, they're ejecting surviving microbes back out into the soil to acquire more nutrients. So like we're farming plants on our, in our agriculture, they are farming microbes in their uh, microbial microbe culture. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and in fact, these microbes, uh, really determine the, the nutritional uh, status of crops. And they also determine the health of those crops. And uh, these microbes happen to be endophytes. Uh, they, they live in the soil, but they're also taken into the plant. And uh, these endophytes are microbes that go into the plant and they don't cause any disease. Instead, they have beneficial effects in plants. And some of you may be familiar with the the turf grass or, or the forage grass endophytes, these are fungi that go into plants. And uh, they, in the turf grass industry, these uh, endophytes, these fungal endophytes actually make the turf grasses hardier and resistant to disease and uh, resistant to stress and so forth. And this is a picture that shows one of these uh, uh, fungal endophytes in the grass. You see the cells in the background, you see the blue, that's the fungus, okay? so. These other endophytes that I'm talking about mostly are bacteria, but there are some fungi involved, but they'll go into the roots. And, uh, but they're endophytes and they have very similar effects. So endophytes are really everywhere. Okay? All plants have endophytes. In fact, plants have really a community of endophytes that go into them. The roots will take in these microbes. They'll have multiple species of microbes that go into the roots. They'll also have endophytes in the leaves and sheaths, but the ones that we're most interested in are the ones that go into the, to the, to the roots. And uh, really you don't know those microbes are there uh, unless you use a microscope and you use some special stains to visualize them. So you can't 
Okay, here's a plant that uh, we just got legalized in New Jersey. Uh, the the we just we just legalized uh, marijuana. Of course, we haven't seen any around here, but uh, this is actually some seeds, marijuana seeds. And if you look at these plants, uh, if you germinate one of these seeds, they actually carry endophytes on those seeds, and uh, those endophytes and the seeds will go into the the seedling when it when it when it when it it comes out of the seed, and then it'll become an endophyte. Okay, and these are these are bacteria, but these also may be fungi. Okay, this is the hemp seed root. Uh, this is actually the root hair. You can see to the to the picture to the left. That's a root hair. See the little brown structures in there. Those all the brown little dots in there. Those are the bacteria. Those are the endophytic bacteria inside that root hair. And to the right, you see that's another big hair. And that is also filled with bacteria. You can see those spherical structures. Those are all the bacteria there. Uh, those bacteria are underneath the cell wall. So they're inside that root hair cell, uh, but they're actually not in the membrane. So they're not in the cytoplasm, they're just kind of underneath the cell wall. Okay, so the, uh, those, you would not be able to see those bacteria unless you use the special stain. And you can see in the red written up there, DAB, uh, diaminobenzidine, DAB stain, that allows us to see those microbes. They're invisible without that. Uh, and they, we're only able to visualize them uh, with that stain because uh, the plant is secreting uh, superoxide or reactive oxygen onto them. And then that DAB will stain that reactive oxygen. Okay, this is another root hair. This is another one of these uh, hemp root hairs. And you can see the bacteria at the tip. And you can see little rods there, little blue rods there in them, uh, at the tip there. Uh, and you can see all the brown there. That's where the bacteria are, where the, where the plant is secreting this reactive oxygen onto the onto the microbe. So the plant gets these microbes from two places. One place is on the seed. So it's important that seeds carry the microbes with them. So if you sterilize your seeds, you kill these microbes and that's not good. Uh, and, but also from the soil. So there's two sources and the, the plant has to have these two sources in, in order to get the best possible microbial community inside the plant. So you have to have a healthy soil and you need healthy seeds that are not where the, where the seed microbiomes have not been damaged. So here's another plant. Uh, this is a giant cactus on a uh, desert, desert island of Bonaire in the Dutch Antilles. And these cacti are all over the middle of that island. Uh, very huge plants and they have fruits way up there. If you take those just like uh, prickly pear fruits, if they're little orange things, you can barely see them, the dots here. But if you take those off, pull the seeds out, it looks like this. And then you take those seeds and germinate them, it looks like this. And this actually, this is one of these cactus, caduceus cactus they're called, uh, that has been stained with this DAB, this diaminobenzidine, so we can see the bacteria. You can see the roots are orange because of that. And if you look at that seedling with a microscope at those roots, here are the root hairs. See the hairs coming across. And you can see all these little dots in there. All those dots are the endophytic bacteria that came through that seed. So this carried through the fruit, carried from the plant, from the plant, from the roots, from the soil, all the way up goes into the fruit. And then it cycles through this plant as this plant goes. This is an endophyte that this is one of these that's seed transmitted. And the, they're the, these seedlings are, Chock a block full of microbes. This is a shows the hair again, root hair of that caduceus cactus, and you can see the little blue dots in there. Those blue dots, you can see some of them are pairs. See where the arrows are. That's where they just divided. Okay, so these these microbes are already in these plants. They're inside the plant cells. So that tells you how closely intertwined these microbes are to the to the plants. They actually become, you've heard of the microbiome, human microbiome, we have microbes all over us. Well, the same way with the plant, the plant has microbes all over the all over the plant, especially now in roots and root tissues and in the root cells in particular area around the root tips. And I'll show you that. Turns out these microbes have all kinds of beneficial effects to plants. And one is they improve the stress tolerance of plants. Uh, they make plants more resistant to stresses like heat and drought, heavy metals, uh, 
other whatever is oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is really all stresses can convert into oxidative stress. And so these endophytes protect the plant from oxidative stress. Uh, they also suppress pathogenic fungi, suppress diseases. So they protect the plant from diseases. And I'll explain how that happens. They will control development or they'll modulate root development. Plants have to have these microbes in them in order to develop properly. If you take away all the microbes, they won't develop right. They'll be sickly plants. If you take away all the microbes and you just give them fertilizer, they will be weak plants. They won't develop properly and they'll be weak. They'll grow big, but they're gonna be weak because they won't be uh, stress tolerant and they won't develop quite right without those microbes. Uh, the microbes in the roots also improve nutrient absorption. The microbes function in absorbing nutrients. That's their, their main function in this cycle we call the rhizophagy cycle, and I'll explain that. Uh, that's the cycle where plants use microbes to get nutrients. And finally, the microbes uh, in plants alter the chemical constituents of plants. If you have the right microbes in the plants, the plants are gonna have a particular chemical profile. They may have more antioxidants, they may have more uh, uh, chlorophylls, they may have more uh, uh, carotenes and so forth. If you put the other, in, other endophytes in there, you don't have the endophytes, you'll, you'll change that chemical profile. It may not be as good. I mean, I, I don't know the particulars, it depends on the situation, but uh, what microbes are involved. In 2010, a group of investigators in uh, Queensland, Australia, uh, discovered actually that plants were internalizing microbes into their roots. And uh, they, um, this, uh, the, one, this actually shows this, this young lady here, uh, Chani Pongfu, is one of the investigators that was involved in this Queensland, Australia group. Uh, and they, 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 what they did was they labeled or stained uh, some bacteria and some yeasts with green fluorescent protein. And then they fed them essentially to uh, tomato plants and also to Arabidopsis plants. And then they visualized those roots of the plants with a microscope. So, and, and with this green fluorescent protein, they could actually see where the microbes were inside the root cells. And they showed they went into the root cells and you can see, for example, image D here in the middle, this, these, uh, all these little green dots, those are the microbes in there. Uh, and uh, they're actually inside the root hairs there. And so the root hairs are loaded. And if you look at E down here, there's another one E down on the left. Uh, you can see a little hair there and you can see little dots in there. That's a yeast in there. And what they also showed is that after three or four days, the, lumen, the, the staining went away and they couldn't see the microbes anymore. And so their concept was that the plants are actually eating these microbes. They're internalizing microbes and they're degrading microbes. And they, they named this process rhizophagy in a, in, a, in a later paper, rhizo for root, phagy meaning eating, rhizophagy. And this paper that they published in PLOS One uh, was called uh, Turning the Table, uh, Plants Consume Microbes as a Source of Nutrients. And that was back in 2010. And we were looking at the process right around that time uh, at, at plants degrading microbes on roots, but we actually, at that time, we hadn't looked inside the root. It was a little bit later, well, after we saw this paper, that we began to look inside those roots and we discovered that, in fact, not only were they degrading microbes on root surfaces, but they also appear to be degrading them in, inside the roots. Uh, we discovered that it appears to be a cyclic process. And that, it, that is that what's happening here is that plants, this is a diagram of a plant root, plants at the tip, right around the, right around the mare stem are actually secreting uh, exudates. They're secreting sugars, they're secreting organic acids, they're secreting, uh, in some cases, uh, amino acids. So they're secreting nutrients outside the root and, and right, right around the mare stem tip, right around the tip of the root, root tip. And that attracts soil microbes to that root tip. They follow that nutrient trail, they follow it right back to the plant and the plant cultivates them there, keeps feeding them outside there. And then right at, at that zone where it's putting nutrients out, 
the plant internalizes some of those microbes into the root cells. It takes them in. We don't know exactly how it does that. It's just pure speculation uh, what, how it might be doing that. Uh, we just don't know the mechanism for the engulfing of the, of the bacteria. However, it does it. We don't know whether the bacterium does it itself or it somehow gets pressed into the, to the cells because the walls are thin there. Uh, so they could easily penetrate into those walls. But we do know they go into the walls because we can see them there. If you look at the picture to the right, you see up B, you see the arrow there at B pointing those, those are bacteria inside those cells right around that area where they're entering. That's the, the epidermal, that's the, the cells, the root cells where they go in. Well, what happens is once they go in, uh, the plant hits them with reactive oxygen, superoxide, and that, that knocks their cell walls off of the bacteria or the yeast. And, and, and then they form these protoplasts. The microbes are naked protoplasts. And, those, and, and they continue to hit those protoplasts with superoxide, which makes those protoplasts leak. And so need, nutrients are leaking. And then those microbes, some of those microbes degrade, but others of those microbes survive. And the survivors will actually trigger root hairs to form on the roots. If we don't have any microbes on the roots, uh, they have in the root cells, they have no, they, they do not make root hairs. So we can deprive seedlings of root hairs by removing all the microbes. And we can do that by very uh, rigorous sterilization. We can remove all the microbes. But if the microbes are there, they trigger root hair elongation. And then as those hairs elongate, those microbes are shot out into the soil through little pores that happen in the tip. And I'll show you that, that process. Uh, but they go back to the soil there. Once they go back out into the soil, they reform their cell walls, the microbes do. And actually the, the plant gives them nutrients enough to reform the cell walls because what, it, what happens is it takes, it shoots out the uh, tips of the hairs, some other exudates that enable those microbes to reform their walls. Then they'll reform their walls. If they have any swimming structures like flagella, they can reform those and then swim out to the soil and get more nutrients. Over here at C, you can see the uh, actually a root hair tip, and this is a fluorescent stain, but you can see all the microbes that are coming out of that hair tip. And uh, I'll show you actually some movies of that uh, show that actual process. So that's a still with fluorescent microscopy. So here's a seed, a grass seed uh, germinating, and uh, uh, you can actually see the root down here at the bottom, the lower arrow, and you can see where the shoot is coming there. And you see some yellow around there, that's bacteria that are coming off. So these, actually these seeds will carry microbes with them. A grass seed will carry, uh, you know, a, a half a dozen or so different or more different microbes that will then colonize that seedling when it germinates and go into the root and also go into the shoot. It's just that uh, we, you know, the rhizophagy cycle doesn't involve those microbes on the shoot, but they're also there. Uh, but they are on the root and uh, they'll colonize that root. And the root actually uh, colonizes them instead of the, or will feed them. And what it does is, uh, this shows a diagram here of a root and you can see this little hump coming out here that says root exudates. That actually is where the root is secreting those, those sugars and, and organic acids and amino acids to cultivate those microbes and attract those microbes. So uh, all roots do that. And all roots that produce root hairs will do the rhizophagy cycle. So the, the root hairs appear to be uh, directly connected with rhizophagy cycle. We always think that root hairs uh, since third grade, you know, we all learned, all of us, every bit of one of us, I think, I did, learned that root hairs function in absorption and that's the role of root hairs. Well. With the rhizophagy cycle, it appears they have a different function. And that function is to eject those microbes back out into the soil, elongate it out into the soil into the rhizosphere where they can put those microbes out where they can get some more nutrients and then bring it back to the plants. So this is, shows a root tip. And uh, uh, you can see the, 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 the dense blue area there at the tip, that dense blue area is where the microbes are entering. So the they're also staining better there with this blue stain, this aniline blue stain. 
And you can see this cloud of blue dots around it, around the outside. Those are all microbes out there. That's a cloud of microbes that the plant is colonizing, is, is cultivating right out there, and then taking them into the cells. If we look closely at these cells, you'd see they were getting filled with these microbes, with these bacteria going in. Once the bacteria go in, the plant will squirt superoxide, reactive oxygen. I know I keep saying reactive oxygen, superoxide, which is a highly potent form of reactive reactive oxygen. And the superoxide gets produced by plants on the root uh, membrane, the root cell plasma membrane. So the membrane on the root cell, it actually can detect those microbes out there. We don't know how it does it, uh, but it appears to detect the microbe and then it squirts superoxide on it. And it squirts superoxide from this kind of a, it's an enzyme, NADPH oxidase or NOx, just NOx enzymes. Uh, in the, and it, that enzyme will take oxygen and produce superoxide. And that superoxide you see there in red, that's the potent uh, molecule. And as, as it turns out, um, the, the, uh, the superoxide is also a defensive molecule. So it's something that plants will do to defend themselves. Okay, and that doesn't mean that this is a microbe attacking it. It means in this case, it is a plant that uses this same uh, uh, molecule, superoxide, to extract nutrients from those microbes. So this superoxide will strip the cell walls off, oxidize the cell walls right off of those, of those bacteria. And this is, what it, this is what it looks like. Okay, this is the bacteria. When they, when they have their cell walls to the left and you see their rods, okay, that's what cell walls. Once they lose their cell walls, you see these little spherical things. They no longer have rod shapes. They become little spherical and they can just bud real fast. And so once the, once the plant, once the root cell removes the cell walls off those microbes and forms these little protoplasts, then it can replicate them also real fast. It can also break them down very fast. So a lot of these get broken down, but others can be replicated to smaller and smaller, many more, essentially they can be cloned. So those that survive this oxidation process they can be cloned and, uh, and then replicated. Uh, so the plant actually makes more of them. So a few will go in and many more uh, actually are ejected back out into the soil. So the plant is cloning these microbes. Okay, this is a cell wall. This is bacterial cell wall. What's the significance of the, taking the bacterial cell wall off? Well, one significance is there's protein in those cell walls. So that's nitrogen. So the, the, the plant actually can get nitrogen by degrading the cell walls off of those microbes. And, and these peptido uh, protein, you can see protein in both of these, peptidoglycan, uh, those are all protein. So that means the plant is getting nitrogen from taking those cell walls off. Okay, this is what it, uh, one of these root cells look like with these microbes in it. And you can see the, uh, their cylindrical kind of shape. And then you see these little spherical structures that are staining red. Those are the protoplasts of the microbe that have been taken into that root cell. And you can see there, they're actually to the lower arrow, you can see there's a chain of three there and you see the, there's a little one that's dark blue. Okay, that dark blue, the blue is protein. And, oops, I didn't mean to do that. But the lighter ones have more protein uh, removed or less protein. So they're breaking down. So, the, so they're being replicated, but some of those are breaking down. Uh, and, the micro, and the plant is getting nutrients from them. So uh, when those microbes go into the root cell, uh, they actually don't go into the cell itself. They just go underneath the cell wall. Okay, and this is a diagram. You can see the gray here. This is the cell wall. And you can see the, uh, the blue space Underneath that cell wall is a space called the periplasmic space, or it's just the space under the cell wall, but it's not quite inside the cell. The cell is this white. And so what's happening here is the plant is keeping the microbes outside that cell, but something else is going on. And I'll show you that. It's also, it's besides hitting them, you see the two O, the two O minus there, those are the superoxide, but also the plant is turning those microbes around and around. It's churning them in something called cyclosis. It moves them around, moves them around. We think that's important because that will break up the microbes into smaller and smaller pieces, smaller and smaller cells, but it also will break down any gradients that form in nutrient exchange. So, so if, the, if the bacterium stays still, 
then nutrients flow from the bacterium to the plant and a gradient forms. Then a gradient means it's concentrated in one area and less and less concentrated, but that slows the transfer. If they're moving like that, the gradients break down and the transfer is fast. So what that enables is maximum transfer of nutrients between the microbes and the, and the, and the root cells. So that's cyclosis, that's called cyclosis. Okay, here it actually shows a, a root hair. And you can see the it's stained for superoxide, this purple stain, something called NBT stain, but it stains superoxide, it stains blue. And you can see it blue, purple, you can see those little blue dots all around. You can see at the tip there, all that blue in there, that's where all the superoxide is concentrating at the root hair tip. But you see it also little blue structures all along. So those, uh, those microbes in the root hair tips are really being hit with superoxide. Well, the uh, microbes in the, inside these roots trigger development in two ways. They'll essentially, uh, if you remove the microbes, you have low development. What happens is uh, roots no longer, if you remove all the microbes, if we sterilize the seeds, so we remove the microbes and seedlings will uh, produce roots where the roots will not have the gravitropic response. Normally roots will grow down like this, go down to the soil. That's what the microbes, you take the microbes and they lay flat on the surface or they go into the air. They don't, they no longer, they no longer have that gravitropic response. The other thing that happens is they no longer, if you remove the microbes, they no longer form root hairs. So you have no root hairs forming. So those microbes are really important for development of those, of those plants, seedlings. They need them there, they're part of development. This shows a root of a grass, this one, uh, Bermuda grass seedling root. And you can see the root tip over here, the left one. And uh, you see the tip over there, the cells going off, those cells falling off, those are the, those are the root cap cells. You see a little bit older area to the right. And you see, the, you see there, there's no hairs. There's no hairs, or if you do, you see little short things that haven't elongated. These are without microbes. Without microbes, you get no hairs. In the same experiment, we take a microbe and then put it on that we removed, we removed all the microbes, then we take it and put it on. And then what happens once we put the microbe on, you see this now. Now you see the tip, you see the root hairs, you see the root hairs forming, they begin to form right away. You also see this is darker. There's more reactive oxygen here with these microbes there. There's that reactive oxygen re relationship, that interaction between the microbe and the plant causes this brown staining now. So this, you see that now, if you, and that has a big effect all over the plant, in fact. But the point here is that with those microbes, you get root, proper root development. Without them, plants are, they don't develop right, they're sick. And uh, essentially, okay, so this is some cells near the root tip. And uh, you can see these little square things, those are the root cells. And you can see the white arrows that I'm showing, the lower white arrow there. You kind of see this brown elongate thing kind of divided into two, you can see a line in the middle. That's one of these bacterial rods or two of them actually of those rods. You can see some others in there, some rod shaped structures, brown structures. Those are the bacteria with their cell walls. So they have just now entered into these cells. They have their cell walls and the plant is beginning to hit them with superoxide to, that will knock those cell walls off. But you still see them at this point, they're still there. So initially when they go in, they still have their cell walls. And that's how we know that they went, how, they, how we know they went in here because we can see them here, but we can also see once they go in, they still have their cell walls. And shortly after this, they will lose their cell walls. And then we track them through the plant. So this actually shows uh, a root, a more mature part of a root. And this is with the bacteria here. This is like a pseudo, pseudomonas endophyte in it, Bermuda grass. And you can see these root hairs out here. See all the little brown dots? Those are all the, the bacteria inside those those hairs. And if you look at the closely at the root body itself, you can see little dots all over it. Those are all the bacteria inside those roots, inside those plant roots. They're inside. The plant has taken them inside. And you see, here's a root hair. And you can see the little red dots, brown dots. Those are all the bacteria, protoplasts now, inside that hair, inside the root hair. They become filled. They become engorged on these bacteria. And these, I should say, these you cannot see unless you use a special stain to visualize them. 
a lot of old uh, illustrations of root hairs have shown root hairs and they just show little the little bubbles and the little spherical things and they've always called them vesicles they didn't know they were bacteria in the hairs in the in the old studies uh, so uh, it's easy not to see these you have to really you have to really look for them and you got to use a special stain to see them okay so this shows uh, this shows a root to the left and you can see uh, the root tip there, you can see a little cloud of microbes around that root tip in the dark area. And you can see the hairs. And the hairs, of course, are where they're ejected back out into the soil. And if you look at the middle one, you can see the hairs there. This is a, a fluorescent stain. You can see the, all these dots, these fluorescent dots are green dots. Those are the bacteria coming out of those hair tips. They're ejected. It's like, it's like you know, the, these uh, hairs will eject periodically, squirt those microbes out, and then they'll grow a little bit and squirt more microbes out and grow a little bit and squirt more microbes out. So they do this periodically. Okay, you look to the right and you can see, there you can see a hair, another kind of grass, and you can see the, the bacteria coming out of the tip there, the, coming out of that hair. So uh, we actually uh, developed, a, uh, uh, well, it's a hypothesis for how it works, but it's a model of how uh, ex ejection of microbes uh, is happening from these root hairs. And we call it uh, the cyclosis expansion wave mechanism for microbe ejection. And that is this, this shows, this shows uh, over here at one, image one to the left, you can see this is a diagram of a, of a root hair. And uh, um, you can see these black dots there, those are the bacteria actually and the, and the, the solid line, that's the cell wall of the, of the root hair, that's the root hair wall. And if you look at the dotted line inside, that's, the, that's actually the membrane of the root hair. If you notice that membrane of the root hair, uh, it is like a needle shape. It's a pointed, pointed shape. It's a pointy shape. It, it doesn't go all the way to the edge of the, of the, of the wall. Uh, instead, it's skinny, a little skinny hair in the middle. And instead, what you have are these microbes that fill in the rest of that space. And they accumulate out there, and 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 what's happening is the there's what we call cyclosis. Uh, that is the that the root hair is moving those microbes around. It's moving cytoplasma around. It's moving the microbes around in a circle, counterclockwise or clockwise. Either way, uh, it goes. It moves the microbes around. It tends to, tends to go in one direction. Maybe it'll reverse at some point, but we've only seen it going one, one direction at a time. And uh, then it moves those microbes to the tip. They accumulate out at that tip. They accumulate at the tip because uh, the cell wall here is very elastic. And so it'll swell. It will, it's elastic, it'll move. The, but along the, the lateral walls, the cell wall is thick and hard and rigid. And so they move to the tip and then, they'll, they, then they're not easily moved from the, from the tip back. But occasionally some will be caught and moved around. Okay, so that keeps happening like that. And then what will happen is uh, there becomes an, a, a, an expansion wave that begins at the base of the hair, and then it expands all the way from the base going out to the tip. And as it expands, it will push those microbes. You can see the microbes, it'll, it'll expand like a bubble, push those microbes out, to, out of pores that happen in the tip. And it turns out those microbes are protoplasts, so they can go out very, very tiny holes very tiny pores. And uh, so once they're out there, they'll reform their cell walls and then go back to the soil. But I'll show you more of this. So what, what is that expansion wave? I, I think I'll discuss that in a, in a minute. This is a sedge. It occurs in the rocks and in, in, uh, on that desert island of Bonaire. One of the nice things about my work is I get to go different places. And uh, so it was nice to do that research on that, on that uh, desert island. You know, it was a it's a benefit of uh, doing the work that I do on plants, studying different plants. So that was a sedge occurs in rocks. It, it, and this is the root hair of that sedge. And what the root hairs lack is they don't have a lot of soil on those rocks, but they do have microbes. This shows the root hair on the bottom and this is stained. This is stained with that, for that reactive oxygen stain. So you can see the microbes and you can see the arrows there indicating where the red is. There's a blue microbe in the middle, maybe one or two in the middle there. And you see the other one, another arrow there to the right, and you can see there the red there, but you also see the blue. That's where the microbe is. It's out there. And now this is the living 
hair. And this is actually a movie we made. Uh, we grew these things, uh, these sedges on uh, in, in an auger, this gelatin. And, uh, and then we visualized it from the reverse of a Petri dish, which is plastic, clear plastic, so that we could see the hairs actually, the microbes moving in the hairs. And what you can see here is that cyclosis is happening. If you see these microbes are moved, looks like counterclockwise here. You can see where the shadows are. Those are where the microbes are. And they're continually moved around like that. And as I mentioned, the importance of that movement is it breaks the microbes up. It clones them so you get a lot from just a little, but it also uh, speeds up the transfer of nutrients from the, from, the, from the microbe to the plant. So the plant can get more nutrients from the microbe. So it, uh, it breaks down those gradients, as I said. Uh, this is a, a hair from that sedge, and you can see what we're seeing here, clusters of those little cells. Some of those are big and some are little. That probably came from, each cluster probably came from one, uh, one cell, microbial cell that was broken up into many little pieces. And you see all the little, the little ones and the bigger ones there. So that's what's happening. The plant is cloning these microbes. After it extracts nutrients, it's cloning them and it's gonna push them back to the soil to repopulate the soil with these microbes. Okay, so this is that hair again. This just shows the tip though. And uh, here you can see uh, the hair, you can see the microbe going along, the shadows going along to the tip and you see them. Now you see the little shadows, the little spherical structures bouncing around the tip. And that's, that's, what the, that's what happens. That's how they look right there. And so this happens and they accumulate there. And every now and then you may see one that gets caught and carried back again. But this is, they stay out here. And in staying out here, they actually can uh, control development of that hair. And we'll talk about that. Uh, or they'll, have, they'll play a role in development in, of that hair. Okay, this shows that ejection. Uh, this is a picture of that. Uh, this is the hair again, that sedge. And you can see all the little red dots in there. Those are all the microprotoplasts inside. And uh, you can see how fat it is. The hair, the actual hair is a little skinny little thing in there. All of this fatness out here is microbes. These microbes are, these hairs are engorged of microbes. These hairs are, are it's um, incredible how many microbes get in there and they, and they eject them out the, the, thin, the thin pores here at the surface, pores that form at the tip. And you can see here around here where the black arrow is, this is where the microbes have been ejected and they're reforming their cell walls here. Once they're ejected, they're no longer exposed to superoxide. They're reforming the cell walls, they go back to the soil. Okay, so this actually shows, and this young lady to the left, uh, Sophia Davinsk, uh, uh, actually did the work on this that helped to generate this movie, but this is tomato and it's showing the actual ejection process. And if you look over here at one, over here to the, all the way to the left, you can see that expansion starts at the base. You can see like a bubble that goes up. And if you look at the middle one, you can see it pushing, pushing. And as it does, it pushes microbes out to the, to the one all the way to the right. And number three, it, they go out. And uh, once they're pushed out, now what we think is going on, uh, we have some data that, that this is probably uh, potassium loading that the plant is putting potassium into the vacuole in this hair and causing water then to go in and so it then it rushes through the out the hair and pushes them out but we have yet to yet to prove that we have yet to demonstrate enough uh, data to uh, to know that that's potassium potassium loading phenomenon it's just that we know that plants will for example use potassium loading for opening uh, stomata and other things so once they invent it for one thing they they can use it for something else. So, but anyways, that we still need to demonstrate that. This is a young uh, tomato, uh, a young root hair initial. And this youngest initial you can see has microbes in it. You can see the little blue dots there. They're already in that hair. As that hair elongates, you can see those microbes are replicating. You can see more, there's the tomato. Okay, there's more right at the tip. They're going to the tip. There they are at the tip as the hair gets more and, and, and they're, they're all black like this. They're, they're dark, they're actually brown because of the reactive oxygen that the plant is putting around them. So there's a lot of microbes in there at the tip, but it's hitting them with reactive oxygen. There shows the tomato 
again, you can see how fat this hair is, all these brown dots now, those are all the microbes in there. The brown, they're, they're, these are fat. These are uh, fat with microbes. There you see it again. You can see all those microbes in there. The hairs in there are little skinny things. What we think is that the, the, the reason that the microbes in the hairs cause those hairs to elongate uh, is because they're producing uh, nitric oxide. They're producing a hormone that causes the hairs to elongate. And we call that the nitric oxide signaling hypothesis. And that is the idea that the, nitri that the microbes in the tip of the hair secrete nitric oxide that triggers, that acts as a hormone that triggers the, the root hairs to elongate. Okay, so this, this basically is the diagram that tries to illustrate that. Uh, the microbes in the hair tip, in that hair tip, produce nitric oxide. That is received by the, by the root hair uh, itself as a signal for elongation, and then the root hair elongates. And nitric oxide is, an, is a plant hormone. So it's a plant hormone that these microbes can also produce. And uh, we think that, and this is, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some other, some data in a minute, but uh, we think that the nitric oxide is actually being produced by the microbe as a defense against the superoxide. That the nitric oxide neutralizes superoxide. There's evidence that it, that it does. There's uh, research that indicates that nitric oxide is actually almost like an antioxidant properties in that respect to protect the microbe from all the reactive oxygen. And what happens is with nitric oxide uh, combines with superoxide, with superoxide produced by the plant, nitric oxide produced by the microbe, then it forms nitrate. And uh, uh, that, that reduces the damage done to the, to, the, to the microbe, but it also results in nitrate that the plant can absorb, the plant root can absorb. Okay, but we're not gonna go into that much. Uh, the student working on this is uh, this student, Ivy Chang, and she, she's a, an excellent graduate student. Um, she's one of the graduate students that actually does what I, what I ask her to do. Most of them are very independent, but this one, she, is, she, is, uh, she listens to me and she does experiments. She is so good so, and so creative too. Uh, but this shows, this shows a root in one of her experiments shows no microbes and seedlings. And you see there's no root hairs. Put the bacterium pseudomonads back in and you can see all the root hairs that form. And uh, then what she did is she looked at, she used this nitric oxide probe, something that would stain nitric oxide and put on the, put on the roots. And, and okay, so basically where this probe is, this nitric oxide probe called DAF FM, Okay, where the nitric oxide is present, you'll see fluorescence. And this shows the, this talks about the, how that experiment was done, but this shows the results. And these little dots, this is with that stain, and you can see uh, nitric oxide right around where those microbes are. All these little dots are where the microbes are. And you see some accumulating right there at the tip, but you can also see some around. So some is actually going out of those, of those uh, microbes. There too, you can see the tip. You see all the microbes accumulating in the tip there. And uh, so she has shown that these, this is a different bacterium, this is bacillus. And you see the same thing. It's a little bit lighter, but you see the microbes uh, with all the nitric oxide around them. The microbes appear to be a source of hormone, nitric oxide, that we think is responsible for triggering hair elongation. The other data, uh, other experiments that we have that supports that hypothesis is that uh, if we use scavengers of nitric oxide or we use inhibitors of nitric oxide, it also stops hair elongation. Methylene blue, for example, scavengers nitric oxide, that'll make hairs so they don't elongate. This chemical named L-name will inhibit nitric oxide formation. That also stops hair elongation. So, uh, so we're building a case that the microbes are, are uh, controlling elongation through uh, nitric oxide uh, signaling. Okay, so what happens to plants if you take away those uh, microbes? This is an example here. Uh, this is a rice seedling. We took away all the microbes and then we, we put it back on the one to the left, E plus, that's endophyte plus. This is rice. You see those seedlings are big. And we, and we left it off of the one to the right, E minus there. 
and they're little tiny. And if a little bit later, you can see the seedlings, it's the same scale, E plus to the left. And you see how big, it's like double the size of shoot. The root, maybe the root is the same length, but look at the soil. The soil adheres to this root with endophyte. Over here to the right, no endophyte, there's very little soil. If you look closely at those roots to the right, also without endophyte, there's, there's no root hairs or very few root hairs that have formed. Uh, so the whole relationship, when you have the microbes there, the whole relationship with the soil changes. The plant with those microbes there can now get those nutrients out of that soil. It's got a closer relationship to the soil. It's, it's a major difference in terms of, of nutrient acquisition for one thing, development and nutrient acquisition. Okay, the nutrient function, okay, we've been working on this of the rhizophagy cycle, nutrient function of the rhizophagy cycle. This is an experiment done by a visiting scientist, a young professor from China came over, it's been a year in the lab. And uh, uh, one experiment that he did, we've done several of these exper um, several of these kind of experiments now, but I'll just describe this one. He basically uh, took wheat, removed the microbes, and then he put the microbes back back on the wheat one at a time, planted in potting mix and, and grew them. Okay, so this shows actually no bacterial, this is just control, all bacteria removed. And you can see these are very tiny roots, stunted roots and shoots. And then he, he, put, it, he put one of the microbes, the bacillus, he put it back on and you can see big roots, like three, four times the size. And you can see shoots like one and a half or double the size over there. It, it made a huge difference in growth of the plant. I mean, that's what you can see. Nutrients are this, if you look at nitrogen. Okay, without bacteria, you look to the number one over here to the left, you can see it's, it's so much nitrogen here, this blue bar. And then you put these bacteria back on. He had three bacteria that he put back on, but they, in terms of nitrogen, they all seem to be doing about the same, uh, but they, the, the plant benefited in terms of nitrogen. If you look at phosphorus, same deal. Okay, phosphorus, no bacteria was down here. Uh, they all benefited with phosphorus. Potassium, looks like number two over here, or strain LB1 over here. Uh, that actually did extremely much better. Looks like three times where the no bacteria were. And the others, the other bacteria did double. So, I mean, it already it's, you can tell it does matter what the bacterium is in terms of what nutrients plants get. So uh, certain microbes will carry certain nutrients, other microbes, other nutrients. And uh, so they're not, all microbes aren't equal. So that's an important, uh, something to remember. Uh, calcium, this is calcium. You see no bacteria and then you see with the bacteria, you see a difference. You see an increase. Here's sulfur, no bacteria. And then you see an increase with sulfur. And manganese, okay, none very little and then almost double with manganese. Magnesium, okay, 30% more. Zinc, okay, 20 or 30% more with the microbes. Okay, so, uh, and this is a point I already made and you didn't see it very much with the, in this experiment, but in other experiments we've done, we can show major, major differences depending on which microbe you use in terms of which nutrient uh, the plants get. Uh, so can we add commercial biostimulants to crops? Okay, that was a question. Are they functioning in the rhizophagy cycle? What do they do? How do they function in here? So uh, Ivy again, you know, did, the, did this. It was important because it's an industrial project. So we're interested in will the, what's happening in the industry out here. And when, you know, will their microbes work also and how will they work? And so she's looking at some of that for her PhD. And uh, she put some commercial microbes uh, in, in a celery. She cleaned the celery up and then she took those commercial microbes, made sure they were clean and then put them into celery. And uh, most of these commercial, most of, the, most of the ones we looked at were bacillus and they go in as endophytes. They're not all equal. There are some again that are better than others, uh, but they all appear to be endophytic. And uh, uh, at least the, one, the ones we looked at, we didn't look at a great number of them. Uh, but this is actually the control uh, with no microbe. And you can see there's no hair here. This is the root tip, this is celery. And you can see with the microbe, this is bacillus amyloliquefaciens, one of the biostimulant product microbes. 
And uh, you can see root hairs forming there where these microbes went in and they became endophytic and uh, stimulated hair formation. You can see this is a close up of the hair with the microbes in it. You can see the hair there. You can see the little brown in there. Those are all the microbes there and the microbes coming out on the surface too. You can see them there. You can see, so these, so uh, commercial strains do work. You always need, if you use commercial strains, you always need to check and make sure they're working on your crop. Uh, you want to you want to make sure no matter what what product you get you want to you want to test it as much as you can yourself. Okay, here are microbes. Uh, microbes alt also alter the chemical com constituents of plants, and this is a, an example here in a tomato experiment. A keratin keratins or keratinoids, and uh, had a student that that took some microbes off of uh, some tomato or, or some carrot relatives, and then put them on carrot and then measured the carotenes in those carrots to see if any of them increased carotene formation. And she found three bacteria, back, I'll just say bacterium one, bacterium two, and bacterium three. And then she put them, and I should say one is from celery, one is from cumin, one is from parsley. And then she put them onto carrot. And you can see these microbes and the carrot hairs there. You see the little dots there. You can see them inside the carrot uh, root cells there. There's little clusters, those little spherical clusters. Those are all the microbes in there. And here's then what she did is she analyzed the carotenes in the carrot carrots themselves. And this shows actually alpha carotenes. And you can see the control over here. It looks like it's all the way to the left control. You can see it's a little bar. Then you see bacterium one. Bacterium one didn't do anything for in terms of carotene formation. It, it was not effective. Uh, bacterium two looked like it almost tripled uh, the carotene content, alpha carotene content. And bacterium three looked like it increased it slightly. Uh, okay, here's beta carotenes. Okay, exactly the same way. You see bacterium two, it, it ma made a major increase. Uh, but bacterium one almost did nothing. You wonder if bacterium one is actually colonizing the root. It may not even be colonizing. Okay, bacterium three increased it, but uh, not as much as bacterium two. So the, the chemical components, the antioxidants, for example, the, the, the pigments and other components that people might consider uh, they might consider them stress tolerance uh, molecules for the plant, or they might consider them health components in the case of carotenes, or we know also lute, uh, lute, luteins. There's some other kinds of pigments we also looked at that are also increased in, in uh, plants with certain microbes. Uh, so those, you know, you can alter, alter that, improve the quality of plants, improve the quality of crops using microbes. We don't know all the details how, and every plant may be different and different microbes have to be experimented with, but there's something there. Okay, so this is a, a, a diagram that just shows how uh, the relationship of, of these microbes is affecting plants and how, uh, if you look at number three here, you see a plant model and the plant basically uh, in going into the soil and cultivating these microbes is, is in, a, in essence, partaking or participating in the, in the microbial community. It's getting those microbes, it's cultivating those microbes, it's getting nutrients from those microbes and it's giving nutrients to those microbes. Those exudates are nutrients and it's taking those nutrients. So there's a flow back and forth. The plant in, a, in essence becomes a part of that microbial community. Uh, there are, up at A, you see this little square, three beneficial outcomes of rhizophagy symbiosis or rhizophagy cycle. And that is one, the plants get nutrients from the microbes. That's a critical outcome. But also uh, because these microbes are going in at, at two here, because the microbes are going in and the plant is interacting with them oxidatively with superoxide and other kinds of forms of reactive oxygen, the plant has to upregulate its own oxidative stress genes, its own antioxidants, its own protection from the superoxide that it's producing. So it does that, and, and then the plants become more resistant to oxidative stress, more resistant to stresses like heat, heat, drought, uh, heavy metals in the soil. 
salt tolerance, all that converts to oxidative stress. And these plants are already resistant to oxidative stress, so they can resist all that. That makes plants hardier and they're more resistant to climate change and more resistant to whatever happens to drought that might happen. Uh, maybe lack of oxygen even gives some oxidative stress, lack of, lack of believe it or not. Uh, it, it will, uh, flooding, for example, will affect, will affect plants and, they, and that they could also be more resistant to that. So, and, but there's another effect and that is these microbes will also go out of the plant and they will colonize pathogenic fungi, any fungus really in the soil, they'll colonize that fungus a lot, we've seen a lot of these do that, bacillus species, also pseudomonads. They'll go out and they go on the surface of these fungi all, all over the hyphae, and they will cause them to leak nutrients. The, the fungus will then leak nutrients. The, the microbe can get it and carry it back to the plant, okay? But the, the uh, fungus leaks those nutrients and it, and it no longer has the oomph or the energy to cause disease. And those fungi then become, we can see the whole behavior change. They no longer sporulate. They'll grow without sporulating. They'll grow slower. Uh, they'll colonize the plant. The pathogen can colonize the plant, but it's not virulent. It'll grow on the plant. These microbes will be all around. These bacteria will be all around it. So it won't cause disease. In some cases we've seen, for example, in fusarium, uh, with the bacteria present, the fusarium becomes an endophyte in the plant. It's endophytic, it's not pathogenic. So these microbes that are involved with the plant that the plant is cultivating protect it in uh, uh, many, in many several different ways. It, it, the whole health of the plant is improved, development, health, and so forth. And so the my very and just in concluding, um, the my take homes here are that uh, seeds should not be sterilized. You should preserve microbes on seeds seeds as much as possible. You should put microbes on seeds. Uh, we've lost microbes in a lot of our seeds. So experimenting with, um, with putting microbes on using products is, is a good idea. That doesn't mean put it on all your crop, but uh, you should do some trials with some of these seed treatments to see how they're, how they're working. Try not to use seeds where they've been, uh, where the husks have been removed. A lot of seeds have seeds, husks removed. Cotton is treated with acid, that's a problem. I, I don't have a solution to that, but the acid kills all the microbes on the seeds and leaves the cotton uh, at a disadvantage and to pathogens and everything else. So, uh, so you know, but, but anyway, seeds with their microbes are better. Manage soil so that you build up the microbial community, okay? Uh, and uh, you can use biostimulant microbes. Uh, they, they do work. They may not work in all circumstances. Uh, and this is a case, this is in, in my view, this is a case where you should do a trial uh, and see how they work in your, in your field and your crops with the plants you're planting. So these are some references, rhizophagy cycle. We published a couple of articles about this in 2018 and 2019. Uh, those are the major articles uh, and uh, those are open access. You can get to those, uh, I'm happy to, Happy to answer any questions about any of this. And these are all the people who could contributed to this over this number of years. We've been working on this a long time. And so a lot of people, all these people have had their little contributions to that. So thank you very much. Keith, I see you're ready for- Yeah, no, that's uh, that was great, Dr. White. We sure appreciate that. That's su such a fascinating topic. I think we could uh, spend <laughs> spend a long time uh, with questions, but I do want to get to a few questions that people have submitted. Yes. Um, I, I could ask you questions for a couple hours myself, but I'll share the time here. Yeah. Th there were several people that asked the question, you know, with this whole process, how do, you know, like neonicotinoid uh, seed treatments or other type of fungal seed treatments and, and things like that, does that affect this? Does, does that harm the microbes and affect this rhizophagy cycle? Well, uh, Rhizophagy cycle is mostly bacteria, but there are fungi that go in and it depends on the plant. Uh, some plants will have yeasts that go into them. And, uh, but a lot of those are like uh, uh, amaranth, for example, amaranth will have a black, a black yeast that will go into the cells, into the root cells, internally colonize the root cells. And I would think if you were using, you, I, I don't think anyone uses that uh, 
those fungicides on amaranth. This is mostly a, like a specialty crop. I don't think they do anyways. Uh, generally, I think neonicotinoids should only affect the fungi and uh, bacteria should not be impacted. So I would, I would think that would have, that would not have a major impact, but you know, we, we haven't checked it and mm -hmm. it's certainly entirely possible. And we just haven't gotten that far into, into testing, yeah. you know, fungicides. So, so in other words, anything that's going to hurt that microbial community on the seed, anything that'll hurt the microbial hurt. community. You just, we just don't yeah. know all the effects yeah. of that yet. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know all the effects. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bad idea. In general, it's a bad idea to treat seeds with noxious chemicals. <laughs> well, now, I will tell you, I will tell you, Keith, uh, many of our seeds, and this, this is highly relevant here, many of our seeds, um, you know, just in cultivating those crops have lost uh, beneficial microbes that were present in in nature. I mean, there was a study that some people did with the wild tobacco where they cultivated this wild tobacco for, for like seven years. And after seven years, they, every year they would take it and bring it in and store it and then plant it again. And it was an annual. And they did that seven years and then it started having a major disease. And they went back and they looked. It was, a, it was actually a, 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 a wilt disease that happens. They went back and they looked at the wild plants and they found they had microbes there that were preventing the 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 wilt disease then they went back they took they got the microbe they put it back on their plant and they cured their disease so just the nature of in that experiment just the nature of taking plants bring them into cultivation causes them to lose microbes so i mean we may have lost for, in many of our crops not just things like cotton where we acid treat them but many other crops uh, yeah. we've lost critical microbes that were protecting those plants in nature and we may have to put them on, I mean, in some cases, using fungicides may be the way that we are compensating, right? By putting those fungicides on hmm. or, 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 yeah, but. So yeah. as a, as a seed company, I've always wondered about this question. Do, do you feel like if we're selling seeds that were grown in kind of a regenerative soil health based system, is that seed going to be better than something grown in conventional ground? And then the second question is, a lot of the cover crops that we use are, are old, old varieties, you know, like iron and clay cowpeas, you know, 100 year old variety really haven't had any breeding done on them for a century. Do you think those are better seeds than something that's been bred, you know, for, for high, high yield, high seed production yield recently? Uh, good question. Uh, first, the answer, the first part, yes, regenerative soil, uh, uh, the biodynamic conditions, right? Biodynamic conditions are better uh, because the, the seeds that can acquire microbes in the process if they're grown properly. Um, and the, in terms of the breeding, the, the issue with, I mean, there are two issues with modern breeding programs. One is in some cases, like for example, corn, they go through tissue culture, right? Which sterilizes everything. That's one issue. What, uh, the, the, the other issue is, they're actually selected for response to uh, or nitrogen, right? That they'll respond to nitrogen and other fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And that might be doing something to the plant. I don't know, right? I mean, this, this doesn't happen in nature. Uh, and the, in nature, plants are doing rhizophagy cycles. So that this is what I, they all do in nature. This is how they do it. That's how they get their nutrients. They're doing this and they're absorbing, you know, other when you give them nitrogen, they don't have to work for it. And uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna show, they're gonna be weaker. They're gonna be weaker. Be lazy. They're gonna be lazy. They're gonna be lazy. <laughs> they're gonna be lazy. And they're not gonna be oxidatively resistant because they don't, they don't have to break down the microbes oxidatively that you're giving them. You can give them the nitrogen. They get all everything they need with that. Yeah, and so they're not gonna be hardy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a question here asking, can compost tea or compost extract, can that work to inoculate seeds or the soil? And, and you know, we since we don't know exactly what microbes those plants use, you know, something like a compost extract right. is yeah. just going to have a wide spectrum. Is that going to be helpful or useful? 
Yeah, I think it, I think it would be. I think I think that, but like but like anything, like the commercial products, you know, I'm a big advocate of you should you should experiment with it. And uh, I mean, I would expect. In fact, my uh, my expectation is that if you can get a a diverse community into your soil that might not have it, you'd be better off than than if you left the say a depauperate soil without a microbial community. So something like a compost tea, you know, uh, would be a good would be a good idea. Something to something worth doing. But you should experiment with it. Yeah. You know, I mean far. Farmers, I think farmers and growers, all kinds of growers are, are you know, adept at, at testing products on a little piece of land. Yeah. You know, so. so. So probably the more beat up and worn out that soil is, the more some of those uh, treatments or amendments might help. But if, yes. if I'm coming into a really rich, really regeneratively grown soil for many years and it's already got a full biological profile, I may not see much of an effect. Yeah. That's yeah. what I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, Dr. White, I would love to, to spend a lot more time asking questions, but uh, I, I want to be sensitive to everybody's time. We've, we've got a lot of people and uh, we need to let them get on to their next thing. So we're very, very grateful. I would encourage everybody to uh, share this. Uh, Noah will email out a link for the recording when we're done here. Uh, and in the next few days, if you've got people that you think need to watch this, certainly get this to them. Again, we're going to, Dr. White has written an article that we'll have under next soil health resource guide. Uh, so we're excited about that too. That kind of sums up a lot of this, but so much great information, Dr. White. We're very grateful for you sharing your time and, and your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Um, Noah, do you have any comments about what's coming up next? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. White. That was very good. Learned a lot. Um, as Keith said, I will be I've got this recorded, so we will be getting this recording out here in the next couple of days. And uh, as far as any questions, you can just relay them back to us. If you did not get them answered, and we can try to get those answered for you or direct them to Dr. White. Uh, as far as next week, we do have Keith is going to be interviewing uh, Trace Genomics, and that's going to be John Jansen, I believe. So we're really excited about that and the opportunities there for. Um, it's not necessarily the same topic, but something along the same lines as far as testing the genetics of seed and really looking at what those plants are doing for the soil. So we're going to kind of continue on the same trend here um, next week. But thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you, Keith. And thank you, uh, James, for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you both. Yep. Good night, audience, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Have a great evening.